Okay, so let's talk about Herman and Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. Now, this book was um, an attempt to outline what is called a propaganda model uh, that was developed by Herman and Chomsky in 1988. And what it describes is a very important aspect of the function of the mass media, that is, to serve the dominant hegemonic interests of powerful groups such as governments and global corporations. Of course, media don't overtly disseminate propaganda unless they are state-controlled or controlled by powerful economic interests. But on the contrary, uh, Herman and Chomsky endorse Gramsci's theory of hegemony when they go about explaining uh, how mass media are usually sympathetic to government policies and corporate decisions and how they tend to marginalize dissenting voices. Their central argument is that media produce consent among the public by reporting government concerns at face value, but neglecting to examine wider economic, social, and historical factors that shape international affairs. So this mode of self-censorship um, is considered by the authors to be much more effective in granting consent to the words and actions of governments and other powerful elites than the sort of more traditional models of state censorship. Unlike the state-produced top-down model of propaganda that was introduced by Laswell and others at the beginning of the 20th century, the propaganda model is altogether more sophisticated and subliminal because it hides behind claims to neutrality uh, that uh, uh, Hall and others talked about those professional codes of uh, objectivity that media institutions insist upon. Media may appear to be free in democratic societies, but as Hall noted, they are by no means neutral or unbiased or impartial in the way they represent real people and real events. Now, the propaganda model proposed by Herman and Chomsky is made up of these five news filters that mass media deploy, whether consciously or unconsciously, when they report on current affairs. The first filter they refer to is the size, ownership, and profit orientation of mass media institutions. There was a time when it was possible for a newspaper or small um, media operation to be produced and distributed across a wide geographical expanse at a manageable cost by relatively a small business. That's not the case anymore. There are huge costs that are involved in establishing any mass media enterprise that's capable of achieving long-lasting success. And that necessarily means that smaller companies can't compete within existing ownership structures. This also means that there's very little hope for new alternative media institutions to challenge the giant corporate networks like Disney or News Corp or Viacom. On the rare occasions when there is a challenge, large corporations are more than likely able to buy out the smaller firm for some exorbitant price, or they will marginalize the small firm, or they will just run the new guy out of business. Now, some of this has been uh, ameliorated a bit in the internet age because of the success of Google and Facebook and other web-based uh, internet enterprises, but pretty much there's only a small group of guys on the big scene as far as media institutions are concerned. So the power of media corporations is decisive because they tend to have far wider economic interests in sectors like pharmaceuticals or oil or IT, while at the same time non-media companies like these have established a strong presence in the mass media. And so, you know, just an example, you could sort of look at the partnership between PBS and corporate entities in order to have money to produce their programs. However, one could easily see how if the news operation were to propose broadcasting something that would uncover unpleasant things about the particular corporation, that would be a problem for that corporation. So if, say, for instance, Exxon was sponsoring some program on Frontline or something like that, and Frontline wanted to do an expose on some large oil spill uh, or unsafe practices within that industry, Exxon might definitely have a problem with that. 
And so there's that chilling effect. All these big businesses also depend upon government and existing large corporations for consent to go about their business. And this would be true of not only those non-media corporations, but also the media corporations themselves. They depend upon the government for information, which I'll get to later, but they depend upon the government for daily functioning as well. So it's not difficult to understand why corporations are keen for media outlets. And many times the corporations will own shares in the the non-media agency. And so it's not hard to see how they're very interested in how media outlets cover or report on political and international affairs in particular. Report on them in a way that sympathizes with the government's point of view that's very important to them. So a second news filter is the advertising license to do business. Now again, we might look back nostalgically to an era when media institutions didn't depend on advertising for their revenue. The early newspapers certainly depended solely on subscription sales and really had no commercial interest other than to sell their news content. Of course, that's all changed now. Advertising has become by far the most effective source of revenue for all kinds of media. Herman and Chomsky note that this dependency on advertising has the effect of forcing mass media institutions to tailor their material to affluent audiences. That is the ideal audience for advertisers. Uh, and as you know, as such, the authors argue that the idea that the drive for large audiences makes the mass media democratic suffers from the initial weakness that its political analog is a voting system weighted by income. And so the mass media, as defined by advertising-led mass media, is therefore a distinctly middle class or even upper middle class one. Now, by contrast, media that aim to cater for working class or more radical anti-consumerist audiences are discriminated against because in this ad-fueled climate, companies won't invest in advertising space for audiences who lack spending power, who don't have any money to spend, or who lack the will to spend. So even mass media can cater to affluent audiences but still lose advertisers if they don't avoid programs with serious complexities uh, or avoid disturbing controversies that interfere with the buying mood. Serious programming like documentaries and uh, critical debate shows that challenge the consensus of government and corporate economics won't only impede the flow of media-generated consumerism, but could also upset advertisers whose interests are to maintain consensus, the status quo. So, unfortunately, media credibility, like media revenue, depends more on advertising than cutting-edge, groundbreaking content. 